call. Say hello. <clears throat> hey, I'm, uh, I'm Praveen. Uh, my nickname is Prav. Um, right now I'm in Miami, but uh, I'll be back in LA um, after this lockdown is over. You got a nice setup there. It's like Star Wars-y. <laughs> yeah, I also host the uh, Miami Science Fiction Film Festival. Okay. So we do a lot of oh, like cool. beyond the film festival. It's once a year. We do a lot of monthly events, including game jams and things like that. Hey, share some of that with our community. If you ever want, you know, you can send us um, some links. You can put it on our Discord. Okay. Yeah, actually, I think it'll be interesting for you guys because we're doing AI this year. So like GPT-3, you know, a lot of JavaScript people are into that. So you can write a script using your AI. And we're doing a lot of AR, VR. So I host the Unity, Unreal, and Magic Leap user groups wow. in Miami as well. That's super cool. But yeah. I yeah, have meetups yeah. in LA as well, but like, you know, go into that. <laughs> I do the same stuff, AR, VR. I'll get up, get up. What, right. what, uh, what are you doing? AR kit mostly, dabbling kind of with AR core, um, kind of doing a little bit of everything, the whole 3D pipeline. So I do modeling, animation, rigging, asset creation, but I also do the coding aspect of it as well. So kind of leverage whatever needs to be done for whatever I'm kind of working with. And I kind of have like another side, like team that I work with right now. We're doing like game development together, building like a side scrolling shooter in Unity. So that's pretty cool. I'm kind of like all over the place, but mainly I guess you could say entertainment technology. That's kind of like, I guess my focus really is entertainment technology, creating like user basically experiences in the aspect of like, like if you're creating like any kind of AR app, you know, you have like an interactive experience with it, you know? So I'm kind of like really like specializing and focusing in the AR realm. Like I love it. Like, completely blown away by everything that can be done with it at this point you know what's what's opening awesome. up with tools like lidar detection and like you know mocap and interacting with different uh yeah just like different techniques and tools in order to create like augmented experiences really yeah and you can do a lot of that with javascript too so it'd be cool if to if you want to do again a panel or whatnot and as long as it's sci-fi related you know you can get noticed by Hollywood Studios. There's only three sci-fi film festivals in the United States, so it's pretty easy to get noticed through us. Very cool. So exciting. Um, network with me afterwards, uh, Praveen. I'll send you sure, yeah. um, yeah, cool. LinkedIn. So that way we can keep in touch. Um, if anybody else wants to just say hello, um, I felt like the last time you know we had a meetup, I didn't actually give people enough time to chat so this time i want to give people a little bit more time say hello and network and tell us where you're from why you found this um, particular topic interesting and what are you studying or what are you doing at work um, i'm chris foster um i'm obviously a senior programmer my uh, life isn't quite as exciting as yours um, working on some legacy code and been learning spelt and i saw your your stuff and I used to work in uh, with the GIS group so I did a lot of maps and stuff and so that kind of connected and I just want to learn a little bit. Okay nice welcome Chris. Thanks. Yeah definitely thanks uh, thanks for saying that you know um, the whole svelte uh, and the map stuff is really interesting and I'm actually looking forward to hearing about that too from Daniel so if you have any questions, keep them on his toes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, while we're going, um, you know, like I said, uh, this is my first time doing a presentation like this. So, you know, if things seem confusing or if I go over something too fast or something like that, uh, please just, I'll try to monitor the, uh, the Discord and the Zoom chats uh, as we go. And uh, yeah, hope everyone uh, learns a lot. Yeah. Um, so there's two things, right? So for everybody who heard the Discord thing, um, I, I want to make sure that people uh, understand like how to get on Discord. Um, I do that pretty much every meetup. And even after I say it like many times, like people still ask me like, what is Discord and <laughs> what is the chat? So um, I'm going to do them as, as often as I can until like um, I never hear a single question about it, which I don't think I ever will. <laughs> So um, if you still want to say something, um, you can just use the chat. I'll come back to it in a minute. And um, I mean the Zoom chat. And then I can um, reach out to anybody who said something. 
And the other thing too is I recommend everybody, you know, uh, on tonight's call to share their LinkedIn because it is a good way to stay in touch with a lot of, you know, uh, smart people. Uh, as I always say, like the reason I founded this group was uh, to help, you know, myself and some of my friends like who started this group with me be better connected, have more, um, you know, uh, successful people and smart people who are doing like coding around like so it's kind of like a cool social circle in that way where we can all kind of network with each other and learn from each other and it's a good ecosystem so I just want to keep that going and you know I hope that you guys um, network and reach out to either me or reach out to others and you know build your own you know um, computer science network <laughs> so um, I'm going to share my screen real quick and I'm going to do the whole spiel and then we'll come back into Daniel. So hang on one sec. Okay, so, um, so yeah, basically, like I was saying, uh, we're a group uh, called HackBuddy and, uh, you know, for the longest time we've been calling ourselves JavaScript LA. JavaScript LA is basically where we started. We started in Los Angeles and we used to do meetups there and then um, somewhere around like, I guess, uh, 2017 or so, uh, we started doing meetups in Orange County. And then after that, we started having meetups also, you know, over Zoom, especially with Corona, um, coronavirus, COVID-19. And so uh, after we started doing our meetups online, you know, especially from, I guess, March and onwards, uh, we found that a lot more people just showed up and, you know, um, were able to keep up with their RSVP. So I think it just works out better that this group is an online group. And, you know, and um, we'll continue to have physical meetups uh, whenever that becomes available. But I think like, you know, um, information is information. And really, it's about being able to connect with, um, you know, smart people wherever you are, independent of location. So that's really why we decided to call ourselves Hack Buddy. Um, so it's not as a confusing anymore for people thinking, hey, do I have to come to LA just to see a meetup? Well, no, that's not the case anymore. We have these remote online meetings. So uh, you'll want to make sure you head over to our website. Uh, right now it is javascriptla.net, but we do have a hackbuddy.com and hackbuddy.org, and those will be available pretty soon. Um, I estimate December or so we'll have like a full functional website. So it should be at that point saying hackbuddy.com. Uh, but for now, make sure that you're aware of the changes. Some of our URLs have changed. So we've changed to youtube.com slash hackbuddy.org. And that's where all of these videos, especially these meetup videos will go. So if you're ever wondering uh, where do I find the video after the meetup, you'll want to go to youtube.com slash hackbuddy.org and then basically uh, subscribe and uh, yeah, you know, this is uh, pretty much the area that you'll see some of the other meetups we had. Uh, we had the Kanban board meetup with Higu um, a few days ago, and then we had one with Gatsby, one on Next.js, and one from Google with Angular. So we've had some really cool meetups, and um, I think we're going to continue having some really great um, speakers from a lot of these cool companies coming out and giving talks. So stay tuned. You'll definitely want to make sure you're part of this group. Uh, be on the mailing list just in case too. And, um, you know, the mailing list is a good way. Uh, one thing I would say is when you're on the mailing list, make sure you white label us or I guess um, remove us from your spam filter because some of the mail goes to spam. Uh, I've heard that. And so if you don't hear from us, um, you may want to check your spam filters because um, some people have complained to me like that they never got an email from me about a new meetup and then I told them to check their spam filter and then they found it. So make sure, like little, little basic things, you're aware of those things. Um, let's see here. So then Discord, there's a big picture of this, you know, Michelangelo statue. Um, oh, right here. Actually, one more. So Discord, uh, there's a picture that says we're all on Discord. So if you click this, right, um, then it'll take you over to your um, <clears throat> our HackBuddy Discord page. And so if you click this link, it'll pop up our Discord. And then basically Discord is an online chat you can use uh, 
to keep in touch with everybody. So there's always a lot of good threads, good um, channels to go to. We have things like um, the Team Hack channel, which I'll get into in a minute, but we also have, you know, like blogs, news. If you're, um, you know, interested in coding in various languages. So I know that we started off as JavaScript LA, but now like a lot of different people are talking about things like AR, VR, Python, um, iOS, Swift. So come and talk about those things with us here too. Um, a lot of people are into data structures and algorithms and studying that so they can get into a fan company. And um, you can come chat in that channel if you want. It's a brand new channel. Uh, there's a lot of different channels. Honestly, you can still talk to us about JavaScript, totally fine. But you know, we wanted to extend this beyond just JavaScript. Our um, thing now is about software engineering. So I hope that makes sense. And then uh, one more thing is just basically you know, uh, we are doing open source coding. And that's what the Michelangelo statue is about. And that's um, under teamhack.org. Um, and it's a good way to just uh, build your own resume. If you're into um, learning some of these frameworks like React, Mongo, uh, Next.js, Gatsby, and all this stuff, but you don't really get the experience of work, or maybe you're a student and you want to have more experience, come join this open source community. All you have to do is just click on, um, you have to go to teamhack.org right here, and then sign up. But then after that, um, you know, you'll get an email that'll take you to a GitHub. And then GitHub is basically where we're doing our open source coding. Um, one of the projects we're working on right now is a React components library, which is pretty cool. Um, we already have like, you know, some stuff happening, including uh, some issues that we created on the Kanban board. So feel free to check those out. Maybe you can get started and help us, you know, code some of our um, reusable components using React and uh, Storybook JS. So it's really cool. Come check that out. And that's uh, basically the long and short of my spiel. I could go on and on forever about all the different things that we're doing at JavaScript LA. <laughs> but uh, this is kind of like the main stuff. So be sure when you check out our website, javascriptla.net or any of our social media channels and you should be um, informed of what we're doing. If nothing else, be sure you're on Discord as well. Um, so I'm actually gonna stop my share and I'm going to go back over to here and just quickly check chat. And it looks like we're, um, we're good. So I'm going to hand it over to you, Daniel. You okay. are welcome to start now. All right, sounds good. Let's see, okay. get my sharing turned on. Okay, here we go. So yeah, hi, uh, my name's Daniel Imfeld. Um, I'm the co-founder of a company called Carevoyance which does um, healthcare marketing research assistance, basically. We, our customers are mostly medical device companies. They look for you know, which hospitals can be good fits to sell their devices, which physicians they might wanna reach out to. And so part of that, you know, we do a lot of reporting, we do a lot of um, geographic mapping type stuff. And uh, we've also been moving from a Angular 1.0 or 1.x application to Svelte over the past year. So as one of the new features that we built was this map based on Leaflet. And it's basically showing referral patterns between physicians. And so, um, you know, I was writing this, I wrote a little blog post uh, just about my experiences of using Leaflet with Svelte. And uh, someone from JavaScript LA reached out to me and said, hey, you know, uh, why don't you give a talk? So here we are. Um, so I think instead of, you know, doing physician data, since that's hard to come by, um, one, what we're going to do for this talk is, uh, look at flows of people moving between different places in the U S. So, you know, the U S census publishes, uh, what they call the census flows mapper. And, you know, it's like, it's a decent application. Um, you can click on a County, you can do the thing. It, uh, uh yeah, there it goes. You know, it takes a little while to load. So, you know, it's like, it's okay. Um, but, you know, it seems like we can probably do better. So, you know, so this is not really a full, um, like, you know, a fully production ready application, of course, it's just a demo, but this is kind of what I put together for this. So you can click on each thing, you can see, 
You can kind of change which ones it shows and things like that. So this is kind of a, a similar thing. It's showing you how people are moving from place to place throughout the country. Um, and it allows you to kind of quickly get an idea of where people are going. Like, so we look, here's the Los Angeles area. So we see lots of people coming in from New England, uh, lots of people, you know, mostly moving out to like, what is this, uh, Portland, Washington, um, Phoenix, and yeah, I guess people coming in from Alaska also. So that's kind of where we're gonna, what we're gonna build um, throughout this talk. So stepping back a little bit, um, I guess we'll start with what Svelte is for people who don't know. So Svelte is, you know, the latest, uh, you know, new hot web framework, kind of like Angular, React, Vue, and so on. Um, the big difference with Svelte is that Svelte is actually a compiler. So it's not just um, taking, taking the code you type and, you know, bundling it together and, you know, providing some sort of state and reactivity stuff in the background, but it will, it will actually look at what you're doing, you know, it will look at the variables you use and allow you to, well, as it says, true, truly reactive, no more complex state management libraries and so on. So we can look at a little example here, uh, simple example. And so you can see here we have um, in Svelte, you know, you, you can just put this uh, dollar sign colon next to a statement. And anytime any of the stuff in here changes, then it will automatically rerun this statement and re-render things. So we have a button, we have an event handler that you know, adds one to name index. And so then every time we click the button, it cycles through the names. Um, and so, you know, there's no, no need for, you know, managing like when to update things or not, no need to think about, you know, how to structure this in any sort of like real uh, reusable way, you know, or, because you know, the compiler just realizes everything that works. You can look at the JavaScript output. We'll just go over this really quick. Um, you see it creates the stuff. Here's where it uh, mounts it in the DOM. Um, and then if we look, where is it? Yeah, so here we say, you know, if, if name has changed, then it uh, sets the data to the new name. Um, if, uh, here's where it updates name index. So it uses this little invalidate thing internally, and that tells it to invalidate one in the bitmap, which, you know, as you see here is name index. So that's just a really, really quick, um, you know, idea of what Svelte is doing for you. You know, so you don't have to handle, you know, making sure that your, app, your updates actually cascade through the app. It just handles a lot of that for you. Um, so that's uh, provided a lot of, uh, had a lot of hype over the past year and you know it's been pretty nice to use honestly uh, so then leaflet is a javascript mapping library and leaflet allows you to basically put together something kind of google maps ish so you know you have your map you can move it around you can put markers and stuff on the map um, as you saw in the uh in the sample application that we'll be looking at you know this is also leaflet and so you, know, you can put regions down and lines and pop-ups and all sorts of stuff like that um, okay, so quick uh, dive into how the data is actually working here. So what we're looking at are so-called metropolitan statistical areas. Um, so there are around nine, 900 something statistical areas uh, in the US that the government kind of keeps track of. These don't really correspond to cities and counties uh, precisely but they correspond to groups where people tend to cluster together. So uh, in this case, we're looking only at the metropolitan statistical areas. Um, each one of these is a place that has, you know, 50,000 or more people kind of grouped together. There's uh, 300 something of them in the US. And each one is grouped around a city or a group of cities. Um, like going back here again, you can see like this is you know, Los Angeles, Long Beach, Anaheim, and so on. So that's, uh, that's you know, one uh, metropolitan statistical area or MSA, as they call them. Um, yeah, so we'll look at kind of the basics of our Svelte app here. Uh, so this is the skeleton app. If you look in the GitHub repo that I linked in the Discord and in Zoom chat, uh, you, can see, um, you can see where that link is. And I'm not gonna go in, this is kind of like my own template that's put together um, to add like all the different stuff that I like. Uh, but the big cool thing that we're using here is Snowpack. And so Snowpack is, um, 
like it's not exactly a bundler, but it's it's a next generation build tool, you might say, designed to speed up development. And so it doesn't do any bundling. Um, it just gets everything working with uh, module exports. And so, you know, you your rebuilds are almost instant. Um, the you get hot module reloading. So when you change something, uh, you know the that particular part of the application just loads and it doesn't have to reload the entire application. You don't have to step back to where you were. So uh, I've just been playing around this with this for a few weeks, but uh, it, it's pretty cool. And um, the Stealth team overall is working on a new kind of, they call it Stealth Kit. Um, and that's going to be heavily based around Snowpack as well. Uh, so let's see. Um, yeah, so I think we'll just jump right into it. So. So in Svelte, your app has a script tag and then an optional style tag, which I don't have here. And then you just have your HTML. And so it's one component per file. So you know, this is app.svelte. We can see in our index.js, it's just creating a new app. Um, this is kind of how you create a Svelte component from JavaScript. You, you just instantiate it like a class. You say the target is where you want it to go. So for the top level app, you're just saying, you know, put this in uh, onto the, you know, the body. Um, internally, anytime you put in a, a spell component, it turns into something like this behind the scenes too. But, you know, you don't have to do that, of course, uh, when you're doing it. So, um, yeah, we'll take a look at, so I'm not going to type all these components out in the interest of time, but I will, you know, go through what each of them is doing. Daniel, so, um, real yeah. quick, somebody asked you to increase your font, please. Oh, sure. Yeah, let's see, maybe that's, yeah. Is that better? I think so. Um, okay. We have some people with uh, eyesight <laughs> issues. Yeah, yeah, no problem. No problem. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so hopefully, uh, hopefully that helps out. Thank you. So, yeah, so, so um, I have a bunch of uh, map components that I put together for this presentation. Each one is kind of a different, uh, you know, a different thing you can make in Leaflet. So we have our leaflet.svelte, which is essentially the top level, you know, map component. And so if you look down here, the, uh, the HTML is just this. So we have our div, we have our style, we have set the height and width from the uh, height and width properties, which are at the top here. We have some default values and then you can override them if you want. Um, and then we do what you, we call a use action. So in Svelte, you can say use and then any function you want. And what it does is when this div is created, it will call the function and pass, uh, pass that node to the function. So in this case, uh, we say use create leaflet right here. And so when the div is created, when we instantiate the component, it will call our create leaflet function, pass it that div. And then we dive into the, um, the leaflet API. So you know, we're creating our map. We give it the node, which tells it you know, where to mount. Uh, fit bounds tells it, you know, essentially where to zoom onto. Oops. And then and, uh, we add an event handler. So spelt events, you know, are pretty easy to use. You uh, create an event dispatcher. So we do it like that. And then anytime you call dispatch, the event name, and then, you know, what, whatever it is that you want to pass. So um, here we're just kind of passing through the zoom event from, you know, pass by leaflet out to you know whatever is creating this component and then we'll see how to add you know how to handle that later um we do a little bit stuff here kind of wait for the dom to settle down and then um just you know tell the map to kind of reset itself um here is where we add the tile layer so this is the background it's uh you know it's the streets and the cities and you know the names and stuff like that so you can see um, so you can see when you zoom in a whole bunch. Um, so yeah, all the little rivers and the city names and uh, you know the streets and all that, that's the tile layer in the background. And so with Leaflet, you just tell it, hey, this is you know, this uh, CDN that uh, Carto has, which is you know, a mapping company, has you know, made available. Um, you give it these little parameters and Leaflet just kind of knows what to do with this. Leaflet knows if you give it a URL like this, then anytime it needs um, anytime it needs a tile, it can just call this URL, filling in the right parameters, and um, then you know the cart basemaps.cardocdn.com is set up to to serve that using the same parameters. So we say we add this to the map, 
And then from our, um, from our create leaflet action function, we just return a little object. And so we say destroy. And so when Svelte sees that this div, if this div here is being torn down, sorry, I'm moving a little fast. Um, if this div is being torn down, then this destroy function gets called. So in this case, we just call the leaflet function to remove the map. Uh, we set it to undefined just for good measure. Um, it does, Svelte also does let you uh, add some uh, parameters. So you could say something like create leaflet equals, you know, um, param. And then you would both get past the param here and um, you would get this update function so that whenever param changes, uh, update would be called and you could do, you know, whatever you want to do. Um, you know, say changing, uh, you know, changing the text that's in a box or, you know, calling something in the leaflet API that you want to call. Uh, we don't need to do that here, but, um, you know, it's a pretty cool, uh, pretty powerful thing that you can do as well. So uh, let's take a look and we will add, well, I guess first actually, let's uh, get this thing going. So I'm using PNPM uh, because I like it. You can use Yarn or NPM or whatever you want. Um, so, so first you would do, oops, you do PNPM install. Um, this is, I've already installed, so you know, it doesn't do anything. Do PNPM dev. Okay, and then start it. You can see Snowpack is um, actually compiling things as they are used. So this is a little warning from Tailwind CSS saying I'm using a feature that's not, you know, really, really there yet. Um, and then you see we have our map, we have our info. I'm going to try to move the browser to the side so you can see it a little better. And there we go. And so then you can see we, uh, you can see how it reloads. So we change it to maps, we click save, and then you know, that shows up you know, really nice and quick uh, on the other side. So what we're actually going to do now is uh, make this into a leaflet component. Let's see, was there anything else in leaflet that I need to do? Uh, the height is set, the bounds. Right, we need the, the initial bounds. So I have set an initial bounds here somewhere. There it is, an initial bounds. And this essentially is uh, you know, the latitude and longitude that you know, roughly covers the continental US. So we will say, we'll pass that parameter into our leaflet map. And we'll save, and there it is. So, so that's the other, like I was saying, that's the thing that's really cool about Snowpack. You know, you just click save and uh, it just shows up right away. It's really fast. You know, say we want to make this info a little smaller so we can do, um, do 64. Okay, so that gives us our basic map. So now we have to put some stuff on it. Uh, so this is going to get into where all this data uh, is actually coming from and how we use it. So I'm going to open up, uh, this giant spreadsheet for a second. So this is the spreadsheet that um, the US Census publishes uh, every, I think they publish it every year. And it's an average of estimates of the past five years of how people are moving between these uh, metropolitan statistical areas. And so, you know, I'm not gonna go through all the detail here, but um, essentially, you know, what we did was I exported this out to a CSV and, you know, because it's Excel, you know, you get like all the, the headers up at top and then you have your numbers that still have commas in them because, you know, it's just how it does it. So you kind of have to deal with that. And so I wrote a little script, which I will go through pretty soon to, um, to walk through all that. But the other thing that we have to do is get the shapes, you know, so that when you're, when you're looking at, uh, you know, you're up here, we actually know how to draw all these little shapes that we're seeing. So for that, I will go back to, oh, I lost my, uh, I lost my repository. So go back to here. So we have our shape data for MSAs. Uh, so yeah, the Census Bureau, basically they publish this stuff as well. Um, so we can download this. It's uh, the CB 2018 US CBSA 500K is the one that we want. That's the file we want. Um, so this is in a format called Esri Shapefile. So Esri is a big uh, GIS company 
Um, they do a lot of uh, mapping for, you know, pretty much every like government website that has a map, you know, it's probably for Esri. Um, and so, yeah, they're, they're all over the place. So because they were around long before people were using, you know, all these new JSON formats, um, they have their own format called Shapefile. So I don't really know much about Shapefile. So I found this, uh, this tool called MapShaper. It's at mapshaper.org. And basically you can upload that, uh, that zip file that, you know, I downloaded, drop it in here and get out topo JSON. And so topo JSON is a pretty cool format because this looks very complicated, but basically what it is, is, you know, you know, as, as you know, you know, uh, states and regions all share borders. So, you know, you have a lot of, uh, you have a lot of, you know, shapes like a square and then you have like some other state here and, you know, some other state here. And so like this state, you know, shares this border here with, um, you know, these two other states. And so in most, uh, you know, geo formats, you would have to represent that over and over again. Topo JSON essentially compresses that by pulling out the shared stuff here into their own spots and then representing it in what they call arcs. So it's saying, you know, we have this topology, it's uh, all these different arcs of all these different, uh, all these different things. And then like, yeah, we'll see if we can go down to the bottom. Um, yeah, well, it's, it's kind of messy, uh, scrolling around in VS code in this giant file, but essentially, um, if you look, if you look into this, what you get is you have all your arcs and then each of the object, um, <clears throat> has a list of which arcs it's made up of. So we can't use that for you actually looking in the map, but we can use it for compressing down our data a lot. So a lot of times what you'll do when you're, um, writing an application that actually needs to send things from the server down to the client is you'll take all the GeoJSON for, you know, whatever regions you happen to care about. You'll use the topo JSON system to compress it down to save a bunch of space. And then on the client, you will uh, recreate that into the full blown uh, GeoJSON, um, which, you know, you can then use in your map. So this kind of uh, simulates that. So we have our create data. <clears throat> uh, this is just a little script I put together to prepare the data, you know, uh, like half the work in a lot of this stuff is just, you know, data cleaning and preparation and all that sort of stuff. So uh, now I'm just using um, the D3 DSV package to parse CSV. You know, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of CSV parsers out there. But so we read our file, um, which was this one uh, exported from the spreadsheet that I talked about earlier. Um, and then we skip the first few rows because they're just headers. Uh, there's a bunch of blank rows at the end. So we skip those two. And then we just pull out, you know, the data that we care about. So we have, so for each row, it has a source uh, MSA and a destination MSA. So, you know, we just, you just look, you say, you know, zero is the ID of the destination MSA. Here's the population. Here's how many people came in total. Uh, same thing for the source. You have the ID of the source. Um, and this is um, actually like the, the ID that the United States uses. So you can see this ID like in all sorts of other places whenever they're referencing. Um, any sort of uh, statistical area. And then the most important thing for this, or one of the most important things for our application is how many people went between these two MSAs. So that's what I called flow. Um, the format number uh, function here is just the thing that rips out the commas, uh, you know, because we don't want commas. And so we also read in our topo JSON, which is, you know, topo JSON for um, all the different MSAs in the country. Um, here is, this is the topo JSON client package. And so this uh, converts the topo JSON into, you know, individual geo JSON shapes, where each shape for an MSA then uh, has the exact lines that it needs to follow to uh, draw the, the whole shape. Um, so we iterate through those. This comes out in a geo JSON object. It has an array called features. So we iterate through those. We do some fancy, um, calculations to make the centroid look right. Normally, you could just do something like a center of mass. Um, for Hawaii, which is where I live, it comes out in the middle of the ocean. So, you know, I just went a little bit fancier here. Um, but yeah, generally, you can get your centroid, which is center of mass. And that's, we get the centroid, um, which is a point that's, you know, kind of in the center of the region. Um, so that we know basically where to draw the lines to and from when we're drawing, drawing lines on the map. Uh, so finally, we go, we, uh, 
we put our ID and our centroid into a map so that we can reference that later. Uh, we do a little bit more stuff to this just is going through all the metro data, which is what we parsed out of that CSV file earlier. So I'm not going to go too much into this, but essentially what it gets out is a list of all the MSAs. Um, it gets a list of, you know, all the people who, you know, the total number of people who came in, the total number of people who went out. And then we also put the individual flows into this flow map. Um, and so the flow map is uh, keyed by both the destination and the source. So that's the number of people that moved between a particular, um, two, moved between two regions. Um, so then we go down, we, we do a little bit of stuff to filter out, you know, MSAs and things that, you know, maybe in one data set, but not the other. Uh, that especially happens in the topo JSON uh, data set because it has a lot of shapes that don't show up in the Excel. And so then we put everything that we actually have data for in this output GeoJSON. Uh, we write the flows into a file called flows.json. We write the uh, MSAs, the data about the MSAs, which is the uh, ID and how many people you know, moved in and out um, total and the population and things like that into MSAs.json. And then we use this topo.json server package, which is the corollary to the topo.json client package to take our GeoJSON and convert it into TopoJSON. And this is actually a surprisingly fast process. It's, it seems like something that would take a while because you know, it's essentially doing like a compression type thing, but it actually goes pretty fast. Uh, so this is something you can actually run in real time on your server for a lot of data sets anyway. Uh, so then we write that out to our uh, topo.json. So we'll take a quick look at this just to see what it looks like. Our topo.json you know, is very similar to um, to the other one that we showed, except it's scaled down a lot because it's only for the regions that we have. So we can take a look. It's like, here's a polygon. Uh, where does that end? And somewhere over here. So it has, the type is polygon, the arcs. So these reference, like I was saying, all the different arcs that end up in the topo JSON, which in this one are at the end of the file. And then the properties, which are just, uh, you know, the ID and then some other stuff that we don't actually use. We do use the name. And if you go down to the end, uh, you can see this is all the different arcs and you know, some of them look kind of weird, but you know, that's okay. Um, we have our MSAs, which again is, uh, we have our, for each region, we have um, an ID, we have the centroid and in uh, GeoJSON, everything is um, longitude first, latitude second. So you'll see this first where you know, we have the negative number for like the United States uh, geographies for the longitude and then the uh, latitude. So we have our population, we have our total outgoing, total incoming. And so that's just uh, you know, some basic information about each MSA. And finally, we have our flows. And just in the interest of space, you know, I, I didn't really make this like a fancy JSON object. Obviously, you could do that. But it's just the source, the, I, uh, the, source, the destination, and then the, um, the number of people who moved between them. So negative three would actually mean you know, they moved from this one to that one. Um, one thing to note about this data set is that there is a large margin of error on some of these. Like some of them, they say, you know, they estimated 80 people moved and the margin of error is like 200. So uh, we haven't dealt with that, but you know, that is something that in a production application, you would probably really wanna, you know, figure out some way to deal with to say like, hey, you know, th these numbers are pretty reliable. These other numbers are, you know, you know, could be plus or minus twice what the number is. Um, but yeah, for now, we, we just skip that. So uh, we'll go back to the actual application. Um, so we'll go up to the top here. And so using, you know, modern, uh, modern web development magic, you can just import these JSON files, you know, from the files themselves. Uh, it's, you know, in a real application, of course, you'd be getting them from a fetch call with a server or something. Uh, we use our topo JSON client package to convert the topo JSON back to, um, back to geo JSON. And then actually if we look, in the console here, we can see where it's logging out all the different features. So it gives us a feature collection. Uh, I'm looking down at the bottom here. And then a big array of features for each one is an MSA. I guess we have 390. Uh, so we have our feature. It has you know, all the properties that we talked about before. And then it has a geometry, which is a polygon with uh, a whole bunch of la longitude latitude pairs. So. You know, this probably is a little bit more um, fine grained than it has to be because you can see a lot of these values are, you know, only differ by a tiny bit. But 
know, that's okay. Uh, there's a there's a lot of functions that can simplify this stuff and kind of you know quantize things so that um, you know points are moved around a little bit so that you know if it's like a line and then the next one is like just a tiny tiny bit south of the next one you know it can just kind of compress those into one line so I didn't do too much of that here but uh, there's a lot of good libraries for that um, and I believe the topo JSON server uh, package that I used to create the topo JSON actually supports that as well. So uh, once we get that, we um, we have our our shapes. We just you know load that into a map so that we can reference it easily later. Uh, we do the same thing with our MSA JSON file. Uh, we just you know kind of load it into a map. We uh, add you know re remember this has the ID and the centroid and the population and some other stuff. Um, I actually put in a little TypeScript types file. So this is everything that's in there. So we'll have our ID, which is the ID of the MSA, uh, the actual name that it's called. Uh, net is the uh, the total number of, basically it's the total uh, incoming minus the total outgoing, uh, which just can be useful to have pre-calculated. We have our centroid, the net as a percentage of the population, which can be useful for you know, the sorting and things like that. Uh, features, the actual GeoJSON, and then a list of the incoming and outgoing flows. So, then, so, you know, we put that together, then we look through our flows. This is just doing the same thing. It's just adding each flow to the list for the source and the destination. If it's negative, then, you know, it uh, just counts, it just kind of reverses that and puts uh, incoming on the source and outgoing on the destination. So that sets up the incoming outgoing flows. Uh, we sort the flows by the count so that, you know, we, you can easily show the, uh, the top, you know, 15 or 20 or five, whatever flows. Um, and then that gives us, little object here, which again has all this stuff. So this is Lynchburg, Virginia. Um, it has 112 incoming flows and 66 outgoing flows and it has the population, the totals and all that stuff. Okay, so a little bit of D3 stuff. This just sets up color scales to use so that, um, you know, we can color the, uh, so we can color the regions roughly by like how active they were with people moving in and out. So this, um, I kind of just use some trial and error to find values that look decent for this. So this is, you know, one of the things that you have to mess around with. Um, uh, this is just a little function which we'll use later, which um, you know takes a net amount and uses one of these color scales to create a color, depending on, you know, if it's positive or negative. So then finally, um, we get our list of active MSAs. So this is again using the Svelte uh, dollar colon syntax. So anytime any of the stuff in here changes, it will rerun uh, this, this whole block. So if MSJs changes, which you know doesn't really happen, it'll change. The big thing that changes here is filter setting, which you know doesn't change yet, but you know will be changing once we set up some controls. So it goes through, it pulls out you know one, one of these uh, functions from the sort and limit. And then, so it, it sorts it by whatever it's supposed to sort it by. It, you know, takes the top X or, you know, in, in the case of all here, it, uh, you know, just uses all of them. Um, okay, so that's kind of where we are for now. So then, yeah, so then we have to actually get this into a, uh, into the map. So here we have a GeoJSON component, uh, which, which I wrote to do this. And one of the things with Leaflet and a lot of other JavaScript libraries is, you know, they are what they call imperative APIs. So, you know, when you want to add something, you actually call this function, you know, on the map. When you want to delete something, you know, you call this other function to remove it. And, you know, that can work okay for, um, and you can kind of make it work. But really, when you have something like Svelte or React or, you know, most other modern state management solutions, they work in what they call a declarative way which is you're just kind of recalculating your state and then whatever is using it just gets the big lump of state. It's getting the whole array and it's not really saying, okay, add this thing, remove this thing. Um, so fortunately, um, you know, one thing Svelte is very good at is uh, managing this since the HTML DOM is also an imperative API. Uh, so, you know, Svelte and React and all those things, you know, they are also taking your, your state of, you know, I want these divs to show up, I want, you know, whatever else to show up and translating that into the imperative HTML DOM API. 
So we can kind of take advantage of that. Um, and this is a technique that I call a domless component. Um, I didn't invent it, but you know, I, I don't really know if it has a name. Uh, where, as you see, the, this component doesn't really have any DOM elements on it. Uh, it just has a slot, which allows you to embed some other stuff inside it. Um, so if we look at the leaflet map again, we can see it's calling this set context. And set context, um, the context in a Svelte application allows you to pass values down to the child components. So because the map isn't, because you have to set the context right away when you're instantiated a component, and the map is not actually instantiated right away. We just use a little function here to you know, get the map. Um, so that way, you know, by the time this actually gets called, then it will return the right value. But so we set context, map, and layer, and layer group. And then so anything that's down below this leaflet um, component can just call get context, which it does in the GeoJSON here, um, which it does, here it is. So it, it tries to get the layer group um, it also tries to get the, a pane, which is, you know, a leaflet concept, which we'll get into in a little bit later. And then it just creates this, you know, leaflet GeoJSON object. Uh, so it creates the leaflet GeoJSON object. It passes in whatever shape you pass to it. Um, and then, you know, we add some events. So we want to see mouse over and mouse out and click. Uh, and it just uses the same Svelte um, event handling that, you know, we talked about before, where, it, you know, it sees like mouse over come. And so then it dispatches a mouse over event to whatever's listening for that. It adds it to the map container. Um, and then in our Svelte on destroy hook, which runs whenever the component gets turned down, we just remove, we just call layer.remove, which tells this GeoJSON object to remove itself from the map. Um, so we can go in and use this. And so in the Svelte, um, the Svelte templating language, you can iterate over an array with this each. So we have each, uh, what do we call it, active MSAs. as MSA. Um, you can put something in parentheses to key it on the ID. This makes it a little more efficient because it, um, it will know then, you know, whenever active MSA changes, uh, it, it knows what to remove or add based on the MSA ID instead of just like using the, uh, the index, you know, in the array. So we'll add our GeoJSON object. And I'm kind of doing this from memory. So we'll see if I get it right. Um, so we will save that. And look, and there it is. So this is just all the default colors. Uh, as you can see with Snowpack, that loaded, that reloaded really fast, which is great. Um, let's see if I can shrink this a little bit. So we'll add some color to that. Uh, I am going to cheat a little bit and see what exactly I typed in my full app. Um, so, just to make it look nice. And so in Svelte, uh, anything that's in these brackets uh, is, you know, a variable that is substituted in. So, fill equals, this is the net to color function that I had above, which just takes the, the net flow and converts that into, um, converts that into you know, some sort of color based on the D3 scales. Uh, we'll just say weight equals two for now. So the weight is the stroke, the stroke size on, on this. Um, let me save that and see. Okay, that did not quite work. So what did I do wrong? So this is where uh, you know things are working great in the um, where things were working great before, and now they are not working so much in the actual in the actual demo. <laughs> uh, that's probably why. Nope. Okay. Well, um, hopefully we can get that working, but. We will see uh, what happens from here. <laughs> but anyway, so we have our uh, we have our GeoJSON. You know, it's filled out all the different um, all the different regions in the country. So then, I think what we want to do next is 
is add some lines between them. So, you know, let's say that we want to see any time, you know, you, you hover over one of these, it will show uh, the top, you know, some, some number of line of regions that people move to. So we can say, um, we can say something like this. So now we have our, um, let me put this in brackets again. So now we have our little uh, event handler functions. So in Svelte, you can just say on colon mouse over, on colon mouse out, whatever events you want to handle. These are the same ones in the GeoJSON component uh, that are dispatched. So you know we say dispatch mouse over, dispatch mouse, dispatch mouse out, and so on. So uh, it's complaining here that hover MSA is not does not exist because it doesn't. So we could say so we can say that, and then uh, then we'll calculate our our set of lines that we want to show. So so we need both uh, incoming and outgoing lines. I guess uh, just a quick question um, yeah. on my part. So I see interface line. Um, that's not TypeScript. Is that something built into? No, that is TypeScript. Oh, oh it is TypeScript. Okay. Yeah. So I wasn't sure if TypeScript was part of Svelte or like it was. You could use it with Svelte. Yeah, it uh, it works pretty well. Uh, you know, there's still a few rough edges here and there, but uh, a lot of work has been done uh, over this year to make it work. So. Okay. Um, it, you just have to put, you know, script lang equals TypeScript up at the I top see. here. That's how you did yeah. it. Okay. Because I, I wasn't yeah. thinking the TypeScript, um, you know, extension on your files. I was thinking where. Oh, right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Because a Svelte uh, component kind of look like looks like HTML. Like it's not, you know, exactly HTML, but it's that's kind of the idea. And so you say script lang equals TypeScript up at the top to make right. that work. Right. Exactly. Um, okay. So let's see. Where was I? Um, you know, I'm just going to copy this from from the full application. So you don't just have to watch me type for a few minutes. So um, we'll call this MSA. And I'll just call it, sorry. see. Ah, uh, no, okay. Sorry, I'm remembering. It's hard when you're uh, remembering what it was that you did before and then uh, trying to <laughs> write this app again in real time. So what I actually did was I had a function called lines for MSA. And so this function takes a reference to the leaflet map, it takes um, a reference to the MSA, and then a number for the number of lines to show. And so this will calculate um, yeah, so this will calculate the set of lines that we want to show for any particular MSA. So uh, for now, we'll get into this a little bit later. Uh, we'll say that the path is uh, from the source to the So this is saying um, oh, it's right, and we have to switch things. So this is one of the one of the things uh, you know. Leaflet uses latitude longitude order, and um, you know GeoJSON uses longitude latitude order. So you do have to kind of convert things a little bit. Uh, so we'll say uh, where are we? So we'll do that. Uh, and then we just need something to set up our lines. So again, we can do a reactive statement. We can have 
lines equals And then, so the only other thing that we need is a reference to our map. So we can say, one of the things you can do in Svelte is you can say bind map and use that a little. And so saying bind map means that this is essentially setting up a two-way binding. So, you know, the leaflet component can uh, set something in the map that will you know, whenever it changes this map property, which it does uh, when it creates the map, this will also set our our map here. So we'll save this. Uh, kind of some sort of error. Yes, yeah, so this is uh, well, Colvin expected here. Oh, right. Yeah, I was just going to ask about that. Yeah. 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 So just uh, just a missing thing there. Okay. So we have our lines. Um, we can add a uh, console.log just to see if it's getting set up right. So we'll open our console here and then we'll look through. And so we see it's kind of jumping back and forth between an array of 20 lines and an array of zero lines. So that's kind of what we expect. Um, so then we just need to render our lines. So uh, I made another component called polyline. This works very similarly to the GeoJSON where you know, we expose all our properties that Leaflet supports. Um, and then you know, just like you created the GeoJSON, you, you get your layer group that you're adding it to, you get your line, you add your events, and you add it to, uh, to the map layer. Um, we do a little bit of other stuff where we, we calculate our line style based on you know, all the props that are set in. This is, again, a reactive statement, so you can just change something on the line, and it will uh, you know, redo that. Um, when you destroy, it removes the line and so on. And again, like the other one, this doesn't actually have any DOM uh, to it. It just has the slot. So then we have our lines. So we can do another uh, each statement here. So we'll do our polyline. What do I call it? So we have lat longs. Okay. Path. And then there we have our lines that are getting drawn. And then, yeah, we have to do and that prevents uh, the mouse handler from kind of screwing things up too. So now you have your lines getting drawn. Um, you know, and it jumps around and you know adds and removes them as you mouse over things. Uh, there were a couple other things you can do. Um, you know, we can make them uh, dashed since that makes them a little easier to read. This is just um, an SVG dash uh, dash property. And so then that's a little easier. Uh, we should use the color that we were going to use. We calculated that in our lines for MSA function. Um, so yeah, so now we can see a little bit of uh, you know, we have the orange lines for incoming, the blue lines for outgoing. Um, and then, you know, something else we can do is actually animate these um, using uh, CSS animations and keyframes. So since I'm using Tailwind, I just put this animation into my Tailwind config, but you can just put it in normal CSS too if you want. So I called it dash offset. Uh, the keyframe um, just animates this stroke dash offset property. And then so, Do that, and it is not animating. <laughs> yes, this is again all the fun stuff that happens during uh, interactive demos. So, um, ah, real quick, like, no, it's, okay, there you go. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, go uh, I was just gonna say, there can you show that tailwind one more time? Because uh, that's yeah. a new thing. Oh, okay, yeah. So, uh, yeah, I didn't go over tailwind. So, tailwind CSS is um, a, it's kind of a framework, but essentially everything in it maps to like a single CSS attribute. 
So as you can see in the little uh, demo down here, um, each you know class that you it has, has all these different classes, and you can add little classes that you know correspond to specific um, specific elements. So you know like text large is just a font size. You know h16 is just a height. W16 is just a width. DG white is background white. Um, like MD flex here is saying you know if it's a, if it's above a certain screen size breakpoint, um, then you want display to be flex. Um, so it's a lot of a lot of that kind of stuff, um, and it has a lot of uh, you know extensibility too. So you know essentially here I'm saying that you know I want to add this dash offset to the set of Tailwind um, animation classes, and so you know it provides some of these by default, but then you can add your own here, and so. I say dash offset. So this is just, you know, then the normal kind of CSS uh, animation uh, spec that you use. You say you want to use the dash offset keyframes, which uh, I, you know, I'm also specifying in the tailwind config here. Um, I'm using a CSS variable to control the animation speed and, and so on like that. So yeah, uh, I definitely recommend tailwind CSS. Um, I, I found that not only do I like using it, but it actually, because all the stuff in here um, corresponds so much to like individual CSS properties, I actually became a lot better at CSS uh, using it as well. So yes, uh, definitely a great, uh, a great product. Very nice. So, um, you had yeah. one other question, sorry. <laughs> like, yeah, no, that's okay. Uh, somebody, uh, Sam asked, what part of the code is making the lines point to specific parts on the map? Oh, okay. So uh, yeah, I glossed over that a little bit. So we have our our lines for MSA, which I was talking about. Um, so the lines for MSA uh, takes a single region here, any one of these regions, you know, that I have the mouse pointer over, and it's um, calculating which lines that we want to show. So we have lines both for incoming, which is people moving into the region, and outgoing, which is people moving out of the region. And so you know, back up at the top before I talked about how we had these incoming and outgoing flow arrays. And so it takes, you know, the top N of that, I think I said N to be 10. Um, and it just iterates, you know, through those top N. It, you know, gets the points. This is the path that it's setting up. So it's taking the source point, which is the center of the source region. And then it's uh, the destination of the line is here, which is the center of the region that you have the mouse over. Likewise, for outgoing lines, the path is going from the, uh, the region that you have the mouse pointer over to the center of the destination uh, region, which is here. And so paths um, can actually have more than one, more than one line segment. You know, so if you add more latitude longitude pairs into here, you know, the path can pretty much be as long as you want. So like actually the GeoJSON, um, the shapes here that are making up the regions are also essentially the same thing. Um, just, you know, Leaflet kind of provides a little better support for that so that you can, um, you can, you know, just give it the GeoJSON and it will do it. But it's doing the same thing, really, where it's putting together a line and saying it's going here to here to here to here to here and, uh, you know, making your shape for you. So, uh, yeah, does that uh, answer the question? Sorry, my chat disappeared. I'm not sure how to get it back. <laughs> um, oh, here's the chat. Yeah. Sam, are you good? I guess uh, if you're good, um, we'll continue. Okay. Yeah, so, so let's see. So we never did get our, uh, our fill color to work correctly, but uh, uh, yes, Sam, uh, there is a link to the code. If you scroll up near the top, um, you'll see it's the fourth message in the window. I have a link um, to GitHub. And that is the link to there. Uh, if you want to look at the full application that actually works with the uh, with the um, the region colors and everything, that will be in the full directory. And the one that I'm working from here is in the skeleton directory. So um, yeah, um, I will. I'll po I'll repost yeah. the ones. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Great. Yeah. So let's see. Uh, some other. So I think you know we were kind of running a little long on time here, so I'm not gonna go through everything else that I had, um, but I will, I will talk about controls a little bit. So um, you know, one thing that Leaflet lets you do is add controls to the map, so it comes with like this built-in zoom control, uh, like that. Yeah, that's weird, like one or two of the shapes actually have the right color and the rest don't. <laughs> that's funny. Um, yeah, 
anyway, uh, let's see. So we can add some controls. So the other thing, just like you know, many of the other uh, you know, GeoJSON, I, I wrote a little controls uh, spelt component as well. So this, again, this does the same sort of thing. Um, it's you know, creating a control uh, using the leaflet um, you know, control uh, API. This one's a little bit different because it needs to actually have your DOM elements to put the, to put, you know, the contents of your control inside. Um, so what this is doing here, I have this outer div, which you kind of need because this inner div actually gets taken away by a leaflet. And then if you ever tear down the control, uh, Svelte tries to remove that from its parent node and it may not have a parent node if it, depending on if it's showing or not. So this uh, hidden div here is just here to make sure that uh, Svelte has something to remove um, after you know, Leaflet kind of takes away the, uh, the other div. Um, so again, in the interest of time, I'm just gonna go and uh, I'm not gonna retype all of this, but we'll just put this in. And then um, we can instantiate it. So again, the map controls, it's using the same thing. It gets the context for the map, just like the other components do. Um, so then we can just add it, let's say right here. And if we look, we now have uh, you know, a few icons here. We have a little box that shows you know, some controls. And so then we can hook that in as well. So, so map controls exposes a few different things. So we can pass it the initial bounds and that makes um, this button work. So you can zoom in, you can click back and it you know, automatically zooms back out from you know, wherever you might be. So that could just be useful to kind of get back to normal. Um, but actually instead of you know, showing all the stuff, I'll just show you like how it actually works. So you know, the map controls component <clears throat> is just a normal spell component. And it contains a bunch of these other control uh, components that actually interact with Leaflet. So this is a good example of using a slot to have some DOM elements. So you can put, um, so if you look back at the control, it has this slot here. And so a slot is, uh, I know in Angular they call it a transclude. I don't know what they call it in React. Um, but essentially it lets you say, you know, I want this I want to be able to provide some uh, content to this component and it will render it where I can put slot. Um, you can have multiple slots. So, you know, you could like have down here like slot equals something else. And then, you know, you could uh, put a something else slot, you know, in when you use this and it would optionally uh, render it there. You can also do, you know, some like default content here so that if this uh, something else slot is not given, then it will just render that. So. Um, so that's pretty nice. Uh, so getting back into this, so we have our button. This is SVG, which um, I got from this heroicons.com. And this is another thing. It's uh, a bunch of nice little free SVG icons. Uh, it's again, by the makers of Tailwind CSS. Um, I'm a big fan of Font Awesome also, but uh, you know, I tend to turn to this for just simple stuff, just because it's really simple. You can go here and just click copy SVG and it just copies it right into your, uh, your copy buffer. Um, so if our button for that, uh, like with uh, handling events on elements, uh, you can just say on you know, whatever element you want, whatever event you want to handle, and it will add that event handler to your uh, HTML element. So we add our click handler. Uh, here we're just calling this function to tell the map to zoom back to the initial bounds. Um, we have a show lines thing, uh, that, so you could toggle sh uh, showing the lines on and off. So this, uh, yeah, it's not. Not wired up yet, but um, so this is another case where you know you might use a bind. So we could say, uh, where are we? We say bind show lines. We could say uh, let show lines equals true. And then we could just put uh, yeah something like that, and so then. You know, we do this, and then whenever we take that off and it doesn't show any lines, you know, you would probably be doing some other highlighting uh, in the actual app. And if you look in, uh, in the actual full app, it is doing some other highlighting there. Um, 
send some other stuff, you know, we can have like radio groups. So Svelte lets you do this bind group. Um, and so you can just say bind group equal, equals whatever you want to set here. And that will just let you, then then so it kind of manages, you know, saying whichever one of these is checked, um, you know, binding that to uh, the, to this variable filter setting here. And then in the same way, you know, we could uh, back in our app, we can, uh, you know, have a, a filter group uh, variable. Um, I think we do actually have filter setting here. So we can say, find, oops, find filter setting. Let's see if that looks right. Yeah, so now whenever I change this, it's uh, showing only the regions with the largest percent change, largest total change, and so on. Um, let's go back to all regions. So uh, the show top, you know, would work the same way. So, you know, you can use this to control uh, how many flows you want to show for each region. Uh, I chose 10, 5, and 3. I'm not going to bother wiring that up. Um, and then finally, um, you know, we have this other control, which is not shown right now but we can put that in too. So we can say, so we can say that. And so then whenever we pass, whenever we change hover MSA, which you may remember is set whenever we put the mouse pointer over, over a region, uh, spelled will automatically set this info MSA um, property to, yeah. And so, now, whenever we put the mouse over a region, you know, we can see that uh, a little thing pops up in the bottom left of the map that says, you know, some kind of statistics about the region. Um, so the final thing I think we'll do, and, uh, you know, there's the, the full app, you know, looks a little better. So, you know, you can, uh, you can play around in there and, you know, see like things where the colors are actually working and all that. Uh, so the final thing I think we're going to do is just make these lines curved because it looks cool. So, um, so that was this make line coordinates that I had. So this is an example of uh, Leaflet's extensive uh, plugin system. And so there's a lot of people who have written some, how does it know the border coordinates of each of the gray areas? Okay, so the border coordinates um, are, that's the GeoJSON and the TopoJSON that I was talking about before. So that was um, this big file that I downloaded, not this one, but, uh, this one. And so this file um, is the one that contains all the borders of, you know, all the different regions on the map. And then I pass it to this create data strip script, which kind of, you know, gets it down. And then from there, it's um, at the top, we're just importing from, we're just importing the JSON data uh, right here, re-instantiating it into, you know, individual, uh, what they call geo-JSON objects. Uh, right here. Um, oh, that's another thing. So there's this geojson.io website. Um, and I actually, if you look on the GitHub repo page, I have a links to a few of these things. So this is a nice way to just play around with geojson and kind of get comfortable with it. So you can see, you know, for all the shapes that you draw, you know, what actually comes out. Um, so, you know, we draw a little line. And so here is actually the geojson that corresponds to this. So if you're not comfortable, with GeoJSON and it seems kind of new and scary, which it can because there's like all sorts of different geometry types and all sorts of different stuff. This is a great tool just to play around with and see, um, you know, see, you know, just like how to do certain things. I, I know it was very useful for me and just kind of getting a handle on, you know, how GeoJSON works overall. Um, yeah. I was gonna add to that um, just real quick. Uh, so you you talked about like a topo JSON. Um, yeah. And is that, I mean, like the source for that, was that coming from, you know, like an Excel sheet earlier and then somebody Oh, okay. That? Yeah, so, um, so the topo JSON file, so I got it from, uh, from this United States State Census website where they publish uh, shapes for all the different, uh, you know, administrative regions. And this is in, they only publish it in shape files and KML. Uh, KML is used by Google a lot, I believe. I don't know who actually invented it. And then shapefiles, like I was saying, um, are used by the company called Esri, which does a lot of uh, you know, government contracting for maps and things like that. 
And so from there, I put it into, I put that into this map shaper uh, website. And you can just drag the zip right into this application and it will spit out, you know, some topo JSON for you. And so, right. so that's where I got all that. Yeah. 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 And it supports like some of the other stuff too, right there, like CSS yeah. files. So that's cool. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so you can spit that all out. And then like somewhere, I think it shows up around here, you get uh, some options to export. And so you, you can just say export to uh, to a topo JSON, and it will just give you another zip file um, or something like that, which you know contains your data. So yeah, this was very useful in um, you know actually taking the shapefile stuff, which you know is great if you're using Esri, but you know, most people aren't these days. Um, if you're, you know, not like, you know, if you don't have a lot of money. <laughs> and uh, you convert again to something that like the open source tools uh, support much more easily. So, all right, thank yeah. you. Yeah, yeah. So uh, one, so one thing that we have in the full app, which I don't know if I still have it up anymore. I do. Is that these lines are curved, which is you know pretty nice and fancy, and definitely makes it easier when you have things like this where they're all going to kind of the same place. Um, so. Someone wrote this leaflet curve, uh, you know, package, which essentially allows you to pass SVG curves, and um, and it will, you know, draw it in a way that is supported by a leaflet. Because a lot of uh, what this leaflet stuff is doing is you are passing it latitude and longitude pairs, and then internally it's, you know, co uh, coordinating with the leaflet uh, component to translate those latitude longitude pairs into like actual SVG or canvas commands or something like that, which, you know, of course are in, uh, you know, pixels or, you know, something like pixels. And so uh, that's a lot of, you know, where this kind of thing comes in. So you give it this and then it, uh, you know, the leaflet thing actually translates that into, you know, which, which pixels that actually need to be set to make that work. So, um, there's a little bit of math involved in that. And this, uh, this link here, again, this is all uh, linked in the readme of the GitHub repo, um, talks about you know, the actual math that is used to do that. Uh, but essentially, um, you have the idea is that you have you know, your line, and then you want to make that curve. So to make a simple curve, you just pick a point that's a little bit up from there, and you have to figure out where to get that point. Um, so you're kind of drawing your line. You say, I want it to be like at this angle. Um, you use some trigonometry to get that. And that's kind of where, um, where this curves thing comes in. I'm not going to go into this. Uh, if you, if you read this article, it actually describes it pretty well, um, in, in how to do it. Um, I, some other people I was talking to said that they didn't have luck doing this, but I don't know, it, it actually worked fine for me. So if you want to just steal this function, um, please feel free to do so. <laughs> uh, so basically uh, what we do here is we, we calculate um, that uh, control point for the curve that we need. Um, and then we return this. Uh, this is basically kind of like SVG commands, um, except with latitude longitude instead of pixels. And so the curve component takes, takes this and uh, converts it into, um, you know, the nice curve. So, so the last thing we need to do, so we have this make line coordinates, we'll just switch everything back to use that. And then down here, instead of our polyline, we will have a curve component. And I have to see what I actually put in my curve component. That's right, so this is called path instead of lat longs. And I think everything else is pretty much the same. Um, we'll go back, we'll see if that worked. Yeah, there we go. So now we have our curves. So the curve component is uh, very similar to the polyline component. Uh, it has all the same, um, all the same sort of stuff, except instead of a polyline, it's just making a curve instead. Um, normally, you would uh, just do L dot curve, um, you know, getting it from from this kind of like this does. Uh, that doesn't work nicely with Snowpack. So what I did was I actually just copied it um, into my own project 
And everywhere where it said like L dot curve equals, I just, you know, made it into an export instead. And that actually works just fine. Um, so so it, it makes it a little farther away from like the traditional kind of leaflet uh, plugin method, which because leaflet kind of it it is old enough that you know you didn't really have like nice bundlers and you know, imports and exports and all the nice uh, ES module stuff at the time. So the traditional way is you just put everything on this global L object, but um, you know with Snowpack it doesn't really work great. So this is a pretty easy way to uh, to make it do that instead. Um, yeah. And then the final thing we're going to do um, is set the uh, set the speed of these lines so that the lines will move faster when they uh, the lines will move faster when um, more people are moving. So what we did here is we have this animation speed, and so that is simply calculated as. And again, this is one of those things where uh, the the calculation you kind of do some trial trial and error to see what looks right. Um, yeah, speed of ant lines, right? <laughs> uh, yeah, so you do some trial and error to kind of see what looks right. So you know, I calculated the percent of the percent of each flow um, of the highest flow for the thing, and you just kind of twiddle with these values until you get something that looks right in milliseconds. So now we do that, and we can see the faster lines uh, are moving faster. Or, well, yeah, the, uh, sorry, the larger flows are moving faster and the slower flows are moving slower. And so that, again, you know, just provides a nice way to kind of visualize this stuff at a glance and see, you know, which ones are most active and which ones aren't. And uh, yeah, so the Fall app has a little more features, but I think uh, in the interest of time, I think we'll just call it there. So I hope that that gave you a pretty good idea of just how this stuff works, uh, how, a little bit of how to use Svelte, a little bit of how to use Leaflet. And uh, yeah, if anyone has any questions or wants to chat, uh, yeah, I'm I'm glad to. Oh, so Sherry, yeah, so orange, orange and blue. Um, so that's just incoming and outgoing. Um, so it's oops, yeah. The problem is I can't. I have no way to really point. Um, so, but if you see the kind of the blue line on the bottom left, you can see it's moving faster than the uh, line above it. And so, um, so that's really where the difference is. Uh, each one. That, that really fast blue line uh, below is saying, yeah, uh, that it's faster. So, you know, again, you can kind of tweak this stuff and see, you know, what you want to do. Like you could put, um, you could put a much larger difference, you know, if you do something like that. And then, uh, so if we do something like that, then, you know, then you can see like the, the difference is much more noticeable. So a lot of it just depends on, you know, how you want to do it, what, what actually looks good, you know, for your particular data set and how many lines are showing and all that sort of stuff. So, yeah. So, uh, yeah, I think, uh, oh, and the other, the only other thing, if you're gonna do these SVG uh, dash animations for it to look right, you'll want to make sure that the total amounts, so like this is eight plus 10 is 18, is the same as in your, your total dash offset in your keyframes. So they should both total up to the same value so that way, when the animation reaches the end, it's kind of back at the beginning and things actually look correct, as opposed to like if you change this around too much, like five, then um, <clears throat> once this reloads, we can see that things will kind of jump around weird. Yeah, uh, maybe the tailwind isn't reloading uh, with Snowpack. Um, so like if we do, uh, you know, eight to 18. And that's yes, kind of hard. To, yeah, so you can see like now and then the lines kind of stutter a little bit because the animation uh, doesn't line up with the actual dashes that are set up. So that's just you know one little thing that you have to <clears throat> you have to make sure that you think about. So um, yeah, so Sherry, uh, what's an example of these lines just like representing COVID spread? Um, yeah, I suppose you could. You know, if uh, you were trying to track like a super spreader event or something, if you wanted to say. Um, if you had some way of saying like, you know, people met in, I don't know, uh, Riverside, and then, you know, there's this big event there and people kind of spread out. And we think that this many cases came, you know, to, uh, you know, Idaho and this many cases came to Texas and this many cases came to Oregon and so on. Um, then, yeah, you could definitely do something like that. You know, like in this case, it's just, you know, it, it's actually a similar sort of thing. It's people moving between regions. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so um, like in our, 
do I, I don't know if I still have it up, maybe I don't. In the, uh, in the application that, you know, I wrote for work, you know, what it was was tracking uh, patients who were referred between physicians. So we drew lines between the physicians um, to, you know, say like, you know, this, we have people who are referred from this physician to this other, other physician and kind of tracking the referral networks. So uh, yeah, so that's another example that you could do. Um, yeah, pretty much anything where you want to draw um, relationships between things, you could use lines like that. Uh, a lot of mapping applications don't use lines. You know, they just, you know, kind of do, you know, regions and then have uh, like markers. Yeah, so the other things you can do with Leaflet, you can have um, little markers that show up. So you can say like these are, you know, each marker is like a person or a city or a point of interest or something. You can have pop-ups and tooltips. Um, there are a few other controls that I didn't talk about in here, like a pop-up control and a tooltip control. Um, you can play around with that if you want as well. Uh, and the leaflet, um, actually the sample app right in the leaflet main page, you know, has like a, here's a tooltip. Here's like a, a pop-up with a tooltip that, you know, opens when you click it and uh, a little marker. So, you know, that's another kind of thing you can do. So. Um, how do you think uh, leaflet compares to Google Maps? Do you feel like it's more fun to use? Uh, so, you know, I have not much experience with the Google Maps API actually. So I can't comment on that a whole lot. Okay. Um, I, I think the nice thing about Leaflet is that you just have a lot of control over what you're doing. Uh, you don't have to worry about, um, you know, any other sort of, uh, you know, you don't have to worry about like APIs and like how much your API quota usage you're using and all that stuff. Exactly, um, yeah. Yeah, I, I do think the Google Maps API is pretty powerful. And I think you could actually set up something kind of similar to to this where you kind of have like your controls which you know don't actually really render any sort of dom elements but are just you know calling into the google maps api given the google maps instance um yeah i think with leaflet you know it's a little more work to get started just because you have to figure out like the tile server and all that sort of stuff but once you do i think uh you know it's not a whole lot of effort to do um but yeah google maps is definitely a nice alternative and you know of course uh I think a big thing is like if you need address searching or anything like that, I'm sure Google Maps is a better job than uh, you know a lot of the other stuff out there. Like there's OpenStreetMap and things, which I haven't played around with a whole lot, but um, you know Google Maps is definitely the king of that because you know they well, I mean you know they have thousands of people whose job is just to you know make sure all that stuff is correct. Yeah. Right, right, and yeah, there's also Mapbox API, and uh, I think yeah, pretty, something pretty similar to. Yeah, yeah, I think Mapbox is uh, probably a good alternative for Google Maps if you're looking for um, for something that is <clears throat> uh, for, yeah for something with like actual people behind it who are working on like data quality and a lot of that stuff. Uh, question: Can you import markers from Google Maps to Leaflet? Uh, I don't know, since uh, like I said, I don't have much experience with the Google Maps API, but. Um, since the markers are probably just like latitude longitude pairs, um, I assume you could do it. Um, you just take the latitude longitude and then, you know, you would want to show, uh, you know, you would, would want to have some icon. So, you know, with like leaflet, you can have um, pictures as, I as icons. Uh, let's see, there's a marker. So you can have a marker which shows up as like a default sort of thing. And then you can make icons where an icon can be a picture or you can use um, what they call a div icon, which is actually just like any sort of HTML. Uh, so like you could use a div icon that renders an SVG, for example. And so um, that's uh, like in the, in the uh, application I was showing from work at the beginning, that's actually what we did. We had markers which rendered um, SVGs. Yeah, so the div icon is, yeah. I'm not sure exactly where it is, but it's in there somewhere. There it is. Yeah, so you can make a div icon, you give it a class. Um, this is a little harder to use because you have to actually like set the, uh, the content, you know, using this like string, L you give it a string of HTML or an HTML element. Uh, so the string could just be the SVG or you give it an element. And if you want to use a div icon uh, and give it like some arbitrary content, uh, I think looking at the way that the pop-up or tooltip uh, components work would be a really good place to start because those are a similar thing where they're taking some some content that you have in your slot here and uh, sending those DOM nodes into Leaflet. Um, 
But you know, again, if it's just an SVG, you can just paste that into the string and you can make your icon you know, with the HTML as a string too. Um, if so. somebody asked, I guess, earlier, like uh, if you know like React or Angular, how hard is it to learn Svelte and how, how much time do you think it would take? Uh, it's honestly, I think it's pretty easy. Um, you know, Svelte, so, oh, sorry, I just answered the one other question from Sherry. So sure. yeah, uh, the string is not a label for the marker in this case with a div icon, but it is. it would be the actual uh, SVG itself. So you would paste the actual SVG with the brackets and the uh, attributes and everything into there. And then when you make your marker, the marker, I believe you can add, yeah, you can add a title to the marker. So that would be like your label. Um, yeah, so as far as, uh, so my experience, like I've seen a bunch of, you know, people using React, um, you know, on the internet because, you know, just like everyone uses React. Um, and I've used a bunch of Angular 1. I haven't used the later versions of Angular. Uh, coming from Angular 1, uh, Svelte was, you know, just, it was great. Um, you know, things are a lot easier to use. You have like all the modern stuff that, uh, you know, you don't have in Angular 1 because, you know, it's just, it's just, just an old framework right now. Um, we started working on our app in uh, 2014. And so, you know, there weren't a lot of great uh, alternatives at the time. But um, yeah, Svelte has been great. You know, there's not a huge, um, there's not a huge API service to it really, which is nice because, you know, you, it's fairly simple. Um, there are some best practices you have to keep in mind. Like there are ways that like the reactivity system works where occasionally if you do certain things like, you know, just push uh, an item to an array, it might not actually see that as a change. So you have to make sure that it sees that as a change and things like that. But uh, yeah, for the most part, I found it very easy to use. Um, you know, there, there are a couple gotchas like that, but you know, in my experience, not a whole lot. And you kind of get a good uh, intuition for dealing with them you know, after not too long. So yeah, I've, uh, I've really been happy with it. So yeah, um, and yeah, please, if you have, oh, uh, so we were talking about Discord earlier. Stealth actually has a Discord uh, server as well. Um, I definitely recommend that if you're getting into Svelte and having you know, issues, there's a lot of friendly people there, uh, including myself, I, I hope I'm friendly anyway. And um, yeah, lots of people, you know, whether you're you know, trying to do something crazy advanced or whether you're using it for the first time, you know, there's, a, there's just a wide range of people there all uh, asking and answering questions. And so you can do that at svelte.dev slash chat. And I don't know what that's actually gonna open. I guess it opens, yeah, the Discord invite site. So, um, so yeah, um, that's definitely good. a good resource to help people get started too. Yeah, uh, one other question I think somebody asked from earlier, and just I was scrolling up earlier. Um, yeah. I think they were asking, how do you keep on top of the material that you're, you know, you're learning? Do you just kind of like, do you have specific resources that you go to or mm. stay, stay ahead? Um, so, hmm, that's a good question. I think actually Twitter, helps a lot with that sort of stuff. Um, you know, if you, you know, if you follow like the wrong people, Twitter can just be a mess and it's horrible. And if you follow the right people, it's a great resource because there are people who are, you know, at least not too crazy who are, you know, posting uh, a lot of stuff that's really useful. So that's, uh, that's a lot of how I hear about stuff. Um, I also recommend, you know, there's a lot of newsletters like JavaScript weekly and, you know, Postgres weekly and Node weekly and uh, Rust weekly and, you know, there's a lot of these like weekly newsletters where they send out links that are just kind of interesting stuff that's happening. So that's a great way to find out new stuff too. Um, a lot of stuff like Leaflet, um, you know, I had to use it. You know, we had to do some maps for work. Um, my co-founder had some experience with Leaflet. So I just dove in and figured it out. So that was really how I learned all this Leaflet stuff that I'm talking about here. Um, yeah, so it's a combination, I think, just of uh, keeping, you know, keeping a, kind of a list of things you would like to learn and just seeing what interesting comes your way and putting yourself in a position where, you know, through newsletters or Twitter or whatever, um, you know, you're getting a, a wide variety of stuff coming your way and, you know, now and then you'll click on something and it'll be really cool. Awesome. Awesome. Well, um, does anybody else have any questions? I, I want to make sure that um, we're, we're all good and happy. Um, <clears throat> Did I share what a D frame was? I don't, did I say D frame somewhere? Um, I don't think I did. Um, this uh, link that uh, Chris Foster posted, yeah, that's a pretty new uh, tutorial for Svelte. 
um, put together by the uh, Mozilla Developer Network. I haven't looked at it myself, but I've heard a lot of good things. So yeah, I definitely uh, recommend looking at that. The um, the spelt uh, the spelt official tutorial is also pretty good. So I I also recommend looking at that. Yeah, there's and you know it's the sort of thing where you can get through it in you know like. I guess it depends on you know how much JavaScript and other stuff you already know, but you know it's not the sort of thing that's going to take you a week to get through. You know you can uh, get through it in a pretty decent amount of time. Uh, yeah, Sherry, I'm sorry, I'm not sure uh, what sort of frame I was talking about. Um, oh, I did mention panes. I don't know if that's what you're thinking. Um, so a, a leaflet pane is a layer. It's just like a layer that can hold um, can hold. Uh, um, objects. So in the in the full version of the app, which I'm posting here, yeah, I, ha I have a pane um, and I have it at a higher Z index than the other shape. And that's just to make sure that the lines always show up at a, that they show up above the shapes instead of below them when we're, you know, adding and removing shapes all the time. So uh, yeah, a pane is just like kind of a group of uh, objects at a different Z index. Um, Leaflet also has, yeah, yeah, the Z index is the main reason to use that. Um, Leaflet also does have layer groups, as so you can make a layer group and add a bunch of layers into it. Yeah, that's right, as opposed to the XY plane, which uh, in Leaflet is latitude and longitude. Um, so you can use uh, layer groups in uh, Leaflet as well, which basically allow you to just apply changes to a group of layers all at once. So like, it doesn't matter quite as much when you're using Spelt and you have it, you know, all with like each is like this and you can just use an if statement. Um, but, you know, you could say like, you know, group, group dot show, group dot hide, something like that, and just show and hide a bunch of different stuff all at once. So that's kind of where that comes into. So yeah, um, I, if you have any questions, uh, I think Twitter is a great way to reach out to me. Um, my email is uh, daniel at uh, infill.dev. So you can also just send me an email. Here's my website, it's infill.dev. Um, yeah, so, I don't think my email's on here, but yeah, it's just Daniel at info.dev. Uh, here's my Twitter link. Um, yeah, so I'm happy to you know answer any questions that you come up with. Um, and yeah, I think uh, I think that's about it. Unless anyone has any other questions. Yeah, um, I think we're good. Like um, I haven't heard anybody else um, in the chat or like kind of speak out. So. Um, yeah, I mean, I think if anybody watching this video, like afterwards, you know, wants to uh, ask a question, you know, we'll take your questions and we'll pass it to Daniel and Daniel can probably respond to you on YouTube. So, um, all right, well, excellent presentation. Uh, a lot that is, um, I mean, like there's a lot that I learned just from watching this and it's super cool. So I, I want to go and look at your Git and really like examine everything. Um, yeah. I think it'd be really fun to just kind of go through. And I mean, like, I think you were saying if you kind of already know like a React or an Angular following along with Svelte is not so difficult. I think it's just a matter yeah. of, you know, just kind of like diving in and just trying to understand. Like, I was going to ask you, what did the dollar sign, like, what does that mean, like, in Svelte? Yeah, so this is, this is really the big thing that makes Svelte different from a lot of other stuff. So the dollar sign, the dollar colon, it is technically like legal JavaScript syntax, so a JavaScript parser can parse it, but, you know, it doesn't really do anything with it normally. Um, but so basically that means that it will rerun any of these statements whenever the dependencies change. So because Svelte is actually a compiler, it tracks what you reference in these statements. So here we reference lines. And so um, anytime lines changes, which as you can see happens right here in a different reactive statement, it will rerun this statement, which is a set of all the regions that has lines. Um, the editor I'm looking at right now is the, uh, the full application, not the one that I was working on. So that's why it looks a little bit different. Um, Makes sense. So yeah, that's basically what it is. So you can have single statements like this, or you can run, uh, rerun entire blocks of code. Um, there is a little bit of tricky stuff, like you know, if you just call, um, you know, like you just call like some function like this, and then the function I can't type right now says you know x equals y plus c. You know, Svelte does not actually look into the function to see that you're referencing y plus c here. So 
you know, there are, you know, some little things kind of like that that you have to be aware of. Um, it can actually be useful occasionally where like, you know, maybe you want to say, you know, FN, you know, Y. So then, you know, this would, uh, this would rerun when Y changes, but not when Z changes. But generally you don't want to do that uh, unless you have a really good reason because it, you know, can kind of make the code hard to follow. Right, so um, it, it's looking at like internal state changes and then re-rendering essentially. Yeah, yeah. Um, so one thing you can do, uh, Svelte has a REPL, which they have online. It's svelte.dev slash REPL. And you can actually look at the, this might be a good one. Uh, you can actually look at the code, the JavaScript output, and it's fairly readable. It can be a little intimidating at first, but, um, it's not too bad to actually read and see what it's actually doing. So like in this case, we have our load counter, which is updating. So I just say load counter dot plus, 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 but what Svelte does is it changes it to this invalidate. Um, this is an index into a bitmap. This is the thing that I actually wrote. And then this is the, um, the value that's it being changed to. I can't quite remember, but you know, anyway, it's all internal. So it does that. And then that triggers the, um, these various change uh, handlers, which are these P methods on the component. And then, so, you know, it just is taking this. And so this one is for this, uh, this image. So it's saying set the source back to this image one source value, which, uh, you know, is set somewhere else in there. I think, yeah, I can't remember. But uh, anyway, yeah, so that's, that's kind of uh, what it's doing internally. So you just write your stuff. And so long as it's in a reactive context, which, you know, is like. Right there. Yeah. Yeah. yeah exactly. Which actually just saying, you know, source here, you know, putting it on in, in the template makes it reactive. So anytime I change source, like here, it's actually updating, you know, it triggers a thing in the dirty bit mask that says that this needs to update here. It, you know, triggers a thing that says, okay, I need to rerun um, all the change checkers and so on. And, you know, the change checkers are pretty fast too, because all they're doing is just, uh, you know, seeing, you know, is this dirty and, you know, is the value that I'm trying to set actually, uh, actually, you know, differ. Unlike, uh, at least in Angular 1, you know, what it did was for every single, um, for every single thing like this, it would set up a watcher. And then anytime anything changed in the app, it would just iterate through every watcher in the entire application and it could really slow stuff down. So, um, I assume newer versions of Angular work better. Um, I know React has hooks and stuff like that to, you know, have its own sort of ways of doing that. But uh, yeah, with Svelte, um, you just kind of do it. And so long as, you know, you're following a couple of rules that it sets down, um, everything just works. Right. Very cool. Very cool stuff. I'm going to go and check it out some more. I feel hyped after this particular meetup. So <laughs> yeah, great presentation. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. No, I'm, uh, Thanks, Brad. It was glad. great. A lot of cool info. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, this is fun. Yeah. Thanks, Daniel. Um, great presentation. Sorry, I yeah. joined late, but I'm definitely going to dive into the source code like BJ was saying. Really great stuff you were sharing. Yeah, sounds good. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Um, thank you all. Thank you all for coming. And um, Daniel, you said you're in Hawaii, right? Like, yes. Yeah, that's right. Oh, that's so cool. Um, yeah, I actually uh, grew up in Los Angeles and then uh, moved uh, up to the Bay Area and then out to Houston. And uh, my wife is a doctor on this really weird visa that requires her to work in an underserved area. And uh, Kauai, where I am, is very underserved. So, uh, so here we are. Um, Jerry, uh, I have surfed once. It, it was a lot of fun. And uh, it was also pretty hard. So, <laughs> um, yeah, so I, I, I don't surf, but uh, it is, I can see why people like it. That is so cool. Well, um, yeah, like the only reason I thought of that was because like your your area looked brighter than mine. Like now, like I can tell it's dark outside <laughs> for you too. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So we're uh, we're uh, two hours behind uh, right LA. now when, when you're on daily saving time. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, all right. Um, yeah, I hope you um, have a good time in Hawaii. Um, more reason to uh, go surfing now. And <laughs> Yeah, thank you for doing this presentation. Um, looking forward to having you again um, at some point, like for another meetup. Uh, yeah, you did yeah, fun. yeah. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. And uh, yeah, like I said, feel free to, you know, send me any follow up questions and
we can get those uh, answered too, or you know, anyone reach out to me on Twitter or email or anything like that. So yeah, thanks everyone. All right. Thanks, Daniel. Thanks. Okay. Have a good night, everyone. Yeah. Thanks. Good night, guys.